and so we now discuss the design rule set and it, uh, as I said before it is a way for the CQ design and for the process engineer to agree on what can be done and what cannot be done um, so uh, there are uh, two things to consider. First, the minimum line width depend, uh, de 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 depends on, pro on lithography and process. Uh, on on, on the, the, the lithography because, of course, the minimum feature size that can be defined by the photolithographic process is a function of the photolithographic process and for example also of the, the the wavelength of the light that is used for the um, lithography <coughs> and it's also uh, a function of the process because of course when you want to etch there's a minimum um, the, the, there is a minimum <coughs> Um, size of the of, of the structures that can be uh, maintained after etching uh, simply because of how you remove the material how you do the etching and so on typically the design rules are expressed now in micron rules so there are minimum absolute dimensions for the intralayer and the interlayer layouts so the intralayer layouts are the layouts within a single layer and the interlayer layouts are the layouts between different <coughs> layers. Different layers means subsequent process steps. Let's see in the detail what it means. Uh, uh, this is a, a very simple very basic process now, 0 0.25 micron. So it, it's uh, now it is a process that used in low performance integrated circuits. It is from the it is from 94, 95 more or less. Uh, <coughs> it typically in the layout use different colors in order to define different uh, layers. So for example, in this region, you have the, the red, that is polysilicon. Then you have different uh, um, colors for the metals, metal one, two, three, four, and five, you see on top. Then there is this white color for the well. And then the active areas are uh, green and uh, uh, it seems like a pink. For the for the uh, N well and the P well, <coughs> so this is just to uh, in, in, the, in the following pictures to recognize the different regions. Then, <coughs> what are these intra-layer rules? For example, for the 0 0.25 micron process, you have this type of rules for the well you can have two adjacent wells and the, dis the distance between, between the two wells must be at least 0 0.6 micron and the width of each well in both directions can be at least 1.2 microns so you see there are minimum feature sizes defined for each particular dimension in each layer so the 0 0.6, I mean the exact numbers are not important. What I want you to understand is exactly what we are defining. Here I'm defining how small can I do the wells, and if they are small, if the designer makes wells smaller than that minimum feature size, typically the process engineer can say no, because we do we will not have reliability and good yield on those wells. Then the active area must be at least 0 0.3 micron and the distance between two active areas to let's say be able to ensure a good insulation it must be at least 0 0.4 micron. 
And these minimum features are, are required because you have toleration, the, you have tolerance fabrication, uh, f uh, tolerance in fabrication. So uh, you need to put this minimum feature size in order to be sure that you have a proper insulation. For the polysilicon, we have something similar. 0 0.24 is the minimum feature size, and at least 0 0.36 is the distance, and so on. Okay, these are intralayer rules because they indicate the minimum uh, feature size for each single layer. But then, when you put subsequent process steps. You put one layer on top of the other and sometimes you want things to be aligned but of course in order to be aligned you need to make them not too small and so you have the other interlayer design rules. Uh, let's look for example at the transistor layout. Uh, <coughs> probably you can recognize that this is a transistor seen from the top. From the top, you have uh, this, uh, uh, one, uh, this uh, um, pink region around, and it's not really pink, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, whitish. It, it is the well. In the well, you have the, the um, transistor. The active area, let me use the highlighter, no, the laser. The active area is this one. So in this area, you have the body of the transistor. Then you have the gate oxide here, and you have the poly. Then you have P-doping in the source and in the drain regions. So this is the transistor seen from the top. This is the width, and this is the length of the gate. So the length is 0 0.24, because it is the minimum gate length of a 0.25 micron process. And then you have some rules that say, OK, if you make a, a P, a P plus um, region for the contact and the poly on top, you need to have at least a distance of 0 0.14 micron. In order to be sure that the poly is in the middle of the active area, you need it to be at least 0 0.44 micron far from the edge of the active area. Okay? So in, in, in order to be sure that the poly covers all the active area, you need in the, in the layout to be at least 0 0.36 micron um, beyond the active area. So these are minimum feature size to be sure that when you overlap two layers, you, you, if you overlap the active area and the P and the poly, at least you have a cross and you have a transistor in the middle. Because, because of tolerance, you could have something different, something different, right? So this set of rules is, uh, is uh, of course, verified uh, by software. You, you have a long set of rules, hundreds of rules, and when the layout is, is, is uh, when f from the circuit one has the layout, one has to run a, 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 the so-called design rule checker in order to check if all these rules are satisfied. Only if all these rules are satisfied, then the layout can be put into production. There are also additional rules for the bias and for the contacts. Uh, the, co uh, the bias are the contacts between two metal interconnections. If you have a metal two, for example, a second layer of metal and the third layer, layer of metal, and you want to connect them, you basically have to cut a hole from, the, from one metal layer to the other and to put a metal in it. Typically, you put a tung tungsten uh, via through it. And this is it. You have metal one and metal two, and then you have a via, and you put tungsten in it. And in order to be sure that you have the cross, you have minimum feature size from the via. 
And then you have the contacts, and again, the contact is, is defined differently from the via. The contact is between a poly or a silicon layer and the metal. So it is something below. And again, you need to have at least 0 0.14 micron from the, 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 the via to the edge of the poly, in this case, and from the via to the edge of the metal, 0 0.0 micron, 0 0.09 micron, in order to be sure that you have everything centered. Okay? So these are needed to take into account of possible tolerances in fabrication. Ah, uh, this is uh, uh, this is a repeat of the same things. Uh, again, additional rules between different layers. Of course, the combination of layers is is gives a large number, and then you have several rules. <coughs> okay. Now, uh, uh, so just just to repeat, the designer from the circuit obtains a series of a complete layout which is a series of masks <coughs> before giving this layout to the fab one needs to run the design rule checker and to check if for all layers all the design rules are satisfied if the answer is yes then the design can be accepted <coughs> this layout is transformed in a set of optical masks. That's it. The only thing that the <coughs> fab has to do is to take this set of masks and to run them in sequence in the CMOS process. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> in the CMOS process flow. So it does not have to know anything about the particular integrated circuit or the particular function of the chip. Once the design rules are satisfied, everything can be done. And the integrated circuit will behave as designed. So this uh, uh, layout plus <coughs> the set of rules design the, uh, define the interface between the chip designer and the fab. Now we can go back Maybe after all these uh, uh, words, it, it is easier to understand again this this uh, figure. You can recognize it pretty <coughs> easily at this point. These are again the two uh, inverters in in series. We have the input with this blue part, which is metal one. Then we have a contact between metal and the red that is poly. So this larger square is required because of the fabrication of the design rules. Then you have the poly for the gate of the PMOS and the poly for the gate of the NMOS. This, this uh, uh, green rectangle here is the active area of the NMOS. This part is <coughs> the drain, this part is the source. You see the source is contacted to this metal line which is the ground and this is the, uh, this is the contact. Then we have the drain which is contacted to this other metal line. This is a metal wire interconnections that connects also the drain of the PMOS and the output. Okay. The, <coughs> the PMOS is identical the only difference is that it is larger because we want to uh, balance we want a balanced inverter then you can see also there are more contacts these contacts are i mean in a larger number because essentially you have space and if you make more contacts you have a, a, a larger conductance so a, a, a better contact overall between the metal layer and the and the source here of the of the PMOS or the drain of the PMOS. Of course, the source of the PMOS is connected to the BDD line. This is another metal line which connects everything. So here you have BDD, here you have ground, and then you can repeat and do it again. As you can see, the structure is very modular. If you have uh, 
several logic gates in series you have a complete line like this with all the logic gates in series if you have a fan out that is larger than one then you have to of course complicate a little bit the the, the picture but in the end it's a nice uh, colored figure and they used to be when they were not too large in the 80s they used to be printed with a large plotter and then on a big table one one could go around and look if everything worked. Just just do a visual inspection of, <coughs> of the city. Of course, now it's much more complicated. One has to, let's say, <coughs> divide everything into modular pieces and look at each piece one by one. OK. Uh, yeah, of course, this is just to explain that the design rule checker I mean, checks the complete layout and looks at all dimensions and check with a set of rules and, and gives a warning or an error or just like a let's say a comp a, a, a comp an error in compile okay it's more or less the same thing now uh, the only additional thing that I want to, to, to say at this point is that typically there is a, a quick way to draw a layout which only takes into account uh, the topology and not the size and the width of each, of each uh, part that is called the stick diagram <coughs> you can see here the topology is there you only see the, with the colors the type of layers you have the two metal lines the two contacts the poly the output metal line and then you have the active area for the NMOS and the active area for the PMOS. This is a fast way to, let's say, pass from the circuit to the actual layout. And this is important because part of this thing can be actually automated. When you have the circuit, you can almost automatically pass, uh, to go, o almost automatically transform the circuit into a stick diagram and again almost automatically transform the stick diagram into a complete layout. Okay. It's not completely easy, especially if you want high performance. Sometimes you have, you have to do some tuning by hand, but uh, more or less it works like a compiler. You start from your compiling your circuit into a layout. That is what is uh, uh, called uh, electronic design automation, okay. EDA. But we, we will de dedicate some 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 minutes to it. Okay, <coughs> now I have uh, some maybe 20 minutes uh, left and I want to mention something about the packaging. Okay, because of course we have discussed everything that is required to make an integrated circuit on a silicon die, but then in practice if you want to use the, the, an integrated circuit you have to put the die into a package. And it's not, uh, uh, let's say, a, a, a secondary uh, thing not a completely secondary thing, I would not say it is primary. Because from the point of view of simply the cost of the chip, sometimes the package is more expensive that, than the content. Okay? Uh, let's discuss the main issues. That there's a complete industry on integrated circuit packaging. So, and it's true when I say that for the cheap <laughs> integrated circuits, at least the package is more expensive than the die itself. You have requirements uh, on different, uh, let's say, dimensions, on different axes. First of all, from the electrical point of view, the package must introduce ideally no parasitics and uh, practically low parasitics. By parasitics, I mean, in a, you, because of the package, you, you have for sure an additional series resistance because you have to go from the die to an external pin, and then you probably ha have some resistance. But then this pin also adds typically an additional capacitance and an additional inductance. And especially for the fast integrated circuits, those can be a problem. This is a huge problem for all the radio frequency integrated circuits because you have to take into account the 
the, um, the electromagnetic behavior of the packaging. Okay. For, uh, for fast uh, processors is also important, for the slow one it is not, but of course they are easier to do. <coughs> then you want it to provide a good mechanical protection of the die. So it must be reliable and robust because it has to protect the die. Then the other more, most mm, mm, very important part is the thermal properties because the package must help you in removing heat. Especially, this is especially important for uh, fast processors because you can have a power consumption per chip of about 100 watts and then you have to remove the heat because uh, uh, integrated circuits cannot work uh, depending, on, 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 depending on the type of, um, of circuit, typically do not work above 80 degrees or above 155. So you, you need to remove heat and the package needs to help. It can help in different ways. It can, it can help with some cooling mechanism or it can help by being made of a material with a low, um, with a low thermal resistance. Okay, and finally, it must be cheap. <coughs> the cheaper, the better, of course. Now, uh, uh, what are the typical situations? The typical situation, the most common situation, is shown here. You basically have a die, which is this white uh, rectangle here. <coughs> In the die, you have the circuit and then on the periphery of the die you have some pads. These pads are uh, square or, or, or almost square uh, metal plates that uh, have to be connected to the output pins. They are typically on the periphery, on the external perimeter of the die and what you do is you put the die on the substrate and you actually glue it to the substrate and then on the substrate you have these lead frames that the substrate is made of an insulator material these lead frames are conductor and then you have to put a bond a bonding wire so a wire that must be soldered here and here and there are very fast machines that can really so everything, they are similar to sewing machines, basically. They just have a, have a um, gold wire and they connect all the, all the pads to the lead frames. This is the most common situation. It has some drawbacks. And the main drawback is that these wires can be pretty long, in the order of uh, one millimeter, and then they can have an inductance uh, of the order of one nanohenry. And this inductance can change the RF property of the, of, of the chip. This is particularly significant for uh, transceivers, for radios, for fa very fast processors, and so on. Because you have an inductance at a high frequency, that, induct that inductance can have a high impedance, and of course, it can, let's say, introduce some delay or some alterations in the propagation of the signal. Then <coughs> it, you need to go from, those, from that substrate to the external pins, but that is the easy part, because basically in the package you have from this lead frame some pins that go outside. Okay? <coughs> As I was saying, this is the most uh, uh, um, common situations. The, the, one of the main drawbacks is that really it cannot be parallelized. You, you have this sewing machine, this bonding machine that does the, the bonding one by one in series. It is fast but it is not parallel. Right? Then there, there is another technique which is actually at the moment less used which is called tape automated bonding and in practice you have a tape like here in which you already have all the wire pattern 
printed on it. I mean, the tape is made of a polymer, and then on top of the polymer you have already the wiring pattern. And you see how it works. Basically, this is the substrate. You put here the dye, you stick the dye to the substrate with a special glue, and then on top of it you put the tape. So that uh, this is the, the, the film plus the pattern. The bottom part of the tape already can be soldered to the pad of the dye with some uh, this, this, uh, these uh, circles there are solder bump. Okay. That procedure requires a very precise alignment, but at least it has the advantage of being parallel. This is called tap or tip automated bonding. You can do it for large scale production. Of course, if you need to do a few hundreds of chips, there's no need to do that. But if you need to do millions of them, it, it, it can be convenient. <coughs> and then there is the other very common procedure that is called this is, this is also very, the, le the least common of the three is the second one. This is also very common. It's called flip chip bonding. Basically, what you do is you do the circuit on top of the die, and then on the circuit you put, the, you put some large pads. And then you have the substrate with the interconnect on top, and you flip the chip. Okay, so you do not use some wire bonding. You basically put the chip with the, with the head down on top of the of, of the interconnections of the package. So the sequence is the following: you first put the package with the interconnect on top, then you put the the soldering material, and then you put the the the, chip, the die. This is convenient, especially if you have very large dies, because you can use uh, <coughs> the, the complete surface. You do, you, in, in the other case, you need to use only the periphery of the, of, of the die. In this case, you can use the complete surface. You, of course, you, 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 this, uh, the, these pads are over the whole surface in the top metal layer. So below, you can have everything you want. But on top metal layer, you put all the pads. When you have a large area, of course, the area increases faster than the, than the periphery. Therefore, it, at some point, it becomes convenient. Because you can have 300 pads. <coughs> that is very typical now. So <coughs> it's, it's hard to have all the, all the pads on the periphery. So this solution is preferred for chips with large area and many pads. Then <coughs> there is this other necessity that is to connect the package to the board. Okay. Then in, in that case you have different options. The simplest one is the so-called true hole mounting. Basically you have external pins for each component and for each integrated circuit, you make holes in the board and then you put the pins into the holes and you solder them. Right? This is the, 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 the simplest possible case. There are some uh, advantages and disadvantages. The nice part is that it is easy to access the, the components to make some tests because you can go from the box, you, you can, let's say, uh, measure anything you want from the bottom but of course there is the disadvantage that you can only use one face of the board for mounting the components so it's not really good for integration is pretty good for testing and it's relatively easy to do <coughs> 
the other possibility is uh, uh, to do the, the other way, surface mount chips. You do not have holes in that case, you just uh, sold the pin to the board on the surface. In that case, I mean, you, you have the advantage of a large, better integration because you can use both faces, but if you want to check, it's not easy to test, uh, for example, the voltage because uh, sometimes it, it is not easy to, let's say, access the pins if it is very crowded. <coughs> it is not clear from this picture, but actually you can also have a higher integration of the of the um, chips on a single side with the surface mount because these pins can be smaller than these ones. Okay, in the case of through hole mounting, you you, you cannot go below uh, <coughs> let's say given small dimension for the hole. So you typically have larger pins and lar and relatively larger packages. For the surface mount, you can have very small packages and very small pins because you do not need the holes. <laughs> but then you, you cannot measure them. OK, these are different types of, uh, of chips. Uh, just, just, just let me discuss. OK, this is a very small wafer. OK, and you can see all the dies. Then you have to cut, really cut into, in, into two pieces and to put each die on the, on, on, on the package. This is the uh, simplest type of packaging. It's called a dual inline package. Let me let me expand. This is, uh, this is dual in line packaging. And you see, basically, this is the die. I, I, I add something here, but you have this wire bonding here on the periphery. And then these lead frames are connected each to one pin. And you have two rows of pins on the two longer sides, this one and this one. Of course, you can see you have to put them on the board with through holes, right? Uh, this is, an, is a similar situation, is a packaged gr package grid array. This is a, a solution that you use if you have, uh, uh, sorry, pin grid array, so, sorry. Pin grid array, it's an array of pin. Um, basically, this is something that you need to use when you have too many uh, pins uh, and of course the periphery is not enough uh, and therefore you start to use also uh, the, the, the middle part. Of course you can imagine that it, this complicates a bit the board, the wiring of the board. And these are instead uh, surface mounted. You can see the, you, the, this, this have this shape that have to go on the board and of course uh, they are much smaller. So also in this situation, this is called uh, <coughs> PLCC. I do not remember the, the acronym, but the, again, it, it's a sort of surface mount. You have a, a <coughs> you have a much higher density. This is again a similar type. You can see you have very very small pins, and. Uh, uh, just I want to finish with this other situation, which that is a, now a pretty common tendency, it is the tendency of having multi-chip modules, which are also called system on a package. In this case, what you have is that in the same package, 
so this is the substrate, you have not only one dye, but more than one dye. So in, in, in practice, you have a small board on the substrate which, in which more dyes are connected. Okay. It's a sort of hierarchical structure because the multi-chip module, the whole package, the whole module is going to another, on to another board. And this is very convenient because you can have a high density of integration because uh, in this case uh, you have uh, uh, typically silicon and silicon. You have the silicon dye, the other silicon dye, you, they are fabricated independently, they are cut and then they are st stuck on a substrate which is again of silicon and then you have some metal lines that uh, are done with the same fabrication process of uh, uh, CMOS chips but are only used to connect together different dyes so that you can integrate uh, in, 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 instead of making a board with several integrated circuits you make a single package on silicon with several dyes on it and it, it allows you to obtain a, a higher integration if you remember when I've shown you the, the iPhone 6 open uh, the A9 chip package actually has two dies, one on top of the other. One is flipped on top of the other, and on top we have the die with the DRAM, and on the bottom we have the die with the processor. And the, in, the, in that case, it, it is a bit different still, because the, the, con the interconnections between the DRAM and the, and the processor occur on but by putting them one on top of the other be because of the, of the pins that are on the two faces. Okay. And also that is another example of a multi-chip module or, or, or of system of package. Okay, I think I can stop here. So we, uh, so let me just finish here.